Welcome everyone to our introduction to Raha Yoga Meditation. We're glad to have you here today and we will just begin in a few moments. Sunny, I believe our audience is all ready, and you can begin whenever you are ready. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Anna. Welcome, everyone. I uh, My name is Sony Sayana, Sony like the TV, um, those spelled S-O-N-I. And um, welcome to this series on Raj Yoga Meditation. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I'm a graduate from RIT, graduated a long, long time ago, 1993. And after I finished my engineering, electrical engineering from IT, I went to Cornell and did my master's at Cornell and then started working for um, Fidelity Investments, which is based out of Boston. And I was in the network engineering department for about 17 years. And I uh, lined up taking a break from corporate and I was a vice president of global network engineering. And it was getting a little hectic with me traveling, my husband traveling with his business. And he's also an IT graduate. So I ended up taking a break and it was the best thing ever. I could be home with the kids and I ended up getting onto this um, journey of meditation, which has been uh, definitely my life calling, I feel at this point. And I've been practicing uh, Raj Yoga for the past eight years, a little over eight years. And it's something that's been a huge transformation in my life. Uh, I never really expected to be leading a life that is as it is. Uh, I definitely. Uh, uh, have a lot of peace and happiness, uh, and which is uh, amazing and remarkable that I can have it constantly. And that's what this practice is all about. So I wanted to share that with you. I do teach um, this with a lot of uh, people in the community. I go to senior centers in my town, a neighboring town, um, as well as a prison um, outside of Boston, a women's prison, and um, share this practice as well. And I team up with three other moms and we do uh, mindfulness in schools, in elementary schools and middle schools, which is so needed these days. So um, that's a little bit of myself. Uh, I want to make sure you can see the presentation, right, Lydia? And you can hear me fine. Absolutely um, can. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So I'll start with a mini uh, meditation first. Um, so... I'll just have you all um, kind of, you can close your eyes, keep your eyes open, whatever you're comfortable with. And I'll do a little uh, mini guided meditation with no music. So we'll just allow yourself to uh, breathe in and uh, breathe out three times. So we'll do a deep breaths in and out, breathe in and out and in and out and in. And out. 
and let your mind put away all of the things that we have to do. It's amazing even in quarantine how we have a to-do list, but somehow we do. If you can put that all aside and give yourself this gift of time and bring your mind to the present moment. And allow it to be open, to take in new information, new experiences, and new knowledge. Okay, now that we're all on the same page. So um, this is a series that um, I'll be doing um, with RIT and I just want to say thank you to Lydia and um, Natalie and Anna, Natalie Anderson for uh, arranging this and inviting me. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and offer the series to everyone. So it's a, it's a three part series. Uh, the first one is soul consciousness and the next one next Friday is on um, inner soul powers. And the last one is on the 15th, which is on karma philosophy. So each one uh, does tend to build on the other, but if you can't make it, no problem. Uh, try and do a little recap before we start um, each session. And any questions, my uh, contact information is right here. It's first name, last name, and gmail.com. So easy enough. All right, so this practice of uh, Raj Yoga meditation originated in India, in Rajasthan, which is the northern part of India, in these beautiful mountains uh, called Mount Abu. And it was a spiritual organization. It's more like a university, actually, because it's, it's very much about the study of uh, Raj Yoga, and everyone is a student uh, that's in this practice. What's amazing about it was it was founded in, in 1937, and it's the largest spiritual organization that was run by women. Um, the founder was a jewel merchant, and he landed up um, forming a trustee, and he gave everything over to eight women. Um, and, you know, the, the head of the organization, she just passed away about a month ago. She was 104 years old. So, you know, talk about in the power of the mind and the body through this practice has been amazing through her, just watching her uh, lead the organization. Uh, but what was remarkable was 1930s where women had, you know, hardly any rights. And here they were, uh, you know, leading this uh, organization was, you know, tremendous, very, very strong women with uh, great uh, leadership skills. And there was a lot of uproar in society when they were doing it. And so they had to face a lot and really had the ability to stay grounded with this organization. So the teachings of Raj Yoga are pretty much centered around um, self-realization and self-transformation. So as I mentioned, you know, I saw a tremendous amount of transformation in my life uh, with this practice, and it's based on a no it's based on knowledge, and that's what really attracted me. Maybe it's because of my engineering background, where you know it's all about you know things that have to make sense, and I think that's what attracted me to this practice of Raj Yoga is because it's very knowledge based. And so when people see meditation, uh, they think it's all about, you know, sitting and closing your eyes and listening to music. But with Raj Yoga, it's, it's you know, give the knowledge and understand uh, how to use a knowledge to have a better meditation experience. Uh, the organization is international. You know, we have presence in the UN. We also have a footprint across the world, 140 countries, over 8,000 meditation centers. And we've been in the US for over 40 years. I'm based out of Boston, so my closest uh, center here in Boston is in a town called Watertown, and we also have another center um, called Inner Space Meditation Gallery Center, which is in Cambridge, and what's remarkable about that is that it um, supports all the Harvard uh, students, so a lot of uh, stressed out students that do take advantage of um, the meditation sessions and get a lot of benefit from it. So Raj Yoga as a practice is very different from a lot of meditation practices out there. Uh, and when people think about yoga, you know, they feel um, very much connected to the body. But one thing that's different is with Raj Yoga, it's not about the body. It's pretty much about the mind. Everything is about understanding the mind and how the mind works. And so when people see the title, they come in with a yoga mat and, and we say, no, just forget about the body, actually, and just sit comfortably and, and relax. and taking the information and the meditation experience. So that's one big uh, difference. And another is, you know, it's about how to make 
um, your mind come under your control. I think that's what's happening where we're not able to experience that inner peace because this mind is thinking a lot, overthinking that leads to a lot of anxiety and you know, with everything going on right now, you know, it's tough not to get some amount of anxiety creeping in. And, um, and so that's why it becomes even more important to have a meditation practice when we're in a time like this where there's so much of uncertainty and, um, you know, that can lead to a lot of, um, you know, overthinking and lack of peace. So I think we can all relate to some of that. And the other thing is to make your mind your friend. You know, that's something that we feel that it's, it's really uh, not in our control. And so I say, you know, you got to find it if you, in case you've lost your mind. And so the study is all about mastery, you know, mastery of the mind. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, investing time in making your mind your, your friend here. And I think that's different about this practice is it's done with your eyes open um, and it's, it's a little challenging and typically when people start, even when I started eight years ago, it was hard for me to keep my eyes open during the meditation. Um, but the, the thinking behind that is that, you know, we live life with our eyes open and so to be able to live your life in a state of meditation would be uh, the goal of this practice. So those are things that make Raj Yoga different from all the other practices out there. So it's all about the mind. So what's in the mind? So the mind is the one that is the thinking and that produces the thoughts. And there was a study that was done that said the mind creates about 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day, which is a significant number. And when I take this to kids and I ask them, they're like, you know, billions of thoughts. And I was like, yeah, it does feel like billions of thoughts, but it's actually not as bad. Uh, and so what happens with these thoughts is that, you know, they don't stop because the mind doesn't really stop producing thoughts. So even when we're asleep, we are producing thoughts. And, and so that's why even though we might get eight hours of sleep, what we're not getting is the rest because the mind is still continuing to produce these thoughts. And that's one of the practices of Raj Yoga is what I've noticed also is, is better sleep just by being able to reduce the number of thoughts. So there are four different categories when we talk about thoughts with this practice of Raj Yoga. The first two I'm sure pre, uh, people are familiar with, which is positive thoughts and negative thoughts. Uh, and negative we're very, very familiar with. The uh, third category is neutral thoughts. So neutral thought is something that's task oriented. I need to do groceries, I need to you know, do a chore. You know, It has no positive or negative connotation. So it's a neutral thought. The biggest um, bucket is something called waste thoughts. And that's where most of these 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts come into. And so a waste thought is something where you're thinking about, uh, you know, the future, a worry thought, uh, you know, your uh, fearful thought or something about the past, something that happened in the past where, um, you know, maybe not such a pleasant uh, situation and you, you keep thinking about it. And so um, that's where the mind tends to uh, stay a lot, is either in the future worrying or in the past, something that happened. And so we have no control over those kind of, um, those kind of two scenarios, the past and the future. And so um, the ability to stay in the present becomes very, very important to reduce the number of, of waste thoughts that we create. And so to really experience inner peace and tranquility is to really minimize the number of thoughts that we have. So reduce it. Um, and I've definitely reduced my thinking. I can feel that, but I'm not sure what the magic number is uh, as to whether it's 10,000, I, I don't know. But I think you can feel it and how you're feeling in, in, uh, from your inner self. And I feel at peace. And I think that's significant because the number of thoughts I have is significantly less. And also what's important is of the category of thoughts is to focus on having more positive thoughts. And um, I think if we can get there, that would definitely be uh, the goal of um, the soul meditation experience. So to be able to reduce those thoughts and to have more positive thoughts requires a little bit more information and, and how we actually do that. And so, um, so we have to kind of dissect some of the mind but first we we uh, you know in raj yoga it's very much about you know the soul and so we have a body which we're all very familiar with the outer shell and the soul is the the inner being and together it forms the, the human and the being to the human being 
And so I think nowadays we tend to do so much that we're more like human doings more than human being. We're not really in the present moment. And so we forget that this being is very, very key to, um, to everything that we do. And so this first topic is about the soul, soul consciousness. And so we talk about the soul, the first part of that uh, topic and go into, you know, what is this soul, this inner being? And um, I think when I teach some of these classes, especially at the senior center, they get really uncomfortable with uh, soul. And I say, you know, if you're, if you're uncomfortable with it, it's the inner spirit, the, the energy inside that is your energy, that's you, that's with you, no matter you know, where you are in this journey in life, whether you're nine or 90, you know, this inner you is what uh, carries forward as you go through life. And that is your, your soul. So the analogy um, that might help also a little is like the, the, the soul and the body being like a driver and a car, where a car is a stationary unless the driver enters it and does something you know, um, has a, a drive in the, in, the, in the countryside and it's a driver that's taking the experiences of going fast or slow as a driver that, that um, you know, takes in all that uh, knowledge and information. It's not the car itself. And if there's an accident, you know, the, the car is not the one that gets hurt. It's the driver that, that experiences that pain. So in the same way, you know, it's the soul, the inner being that is really the essence of who we are and the body is just the outside, which I think is very hard for people to really um, grapple with because we live very much by looking at the body. And this is where Raj Yoga really, really uh, the fundamental piece is differentiating between the two, that there is a soul and the body. And that when you know we look at ourselves, we should, we should see ourselves as a soul. And so I'm a soul and this is my body. And we get wrapped up in the identity of the body a lot. And even when I introduce myself, you know, about who I am, you know, as a, an engineer, you know, we tend to identify with, you know, our role that we play in life. And that pretty much is the dominant, you know, uh, identity of, of who we are is the outside um, function of the body, whereas opposed to the inner being, that's more um, a sense of, of who we really are. And so this practice of Raj Yoga is all about that awareness, coming to the awareness of my true identity and making that shift um, away from the exterior. And, and what happens is when we're focused on that, the exterior, you know, things change. You know, one day you're a governor, the next day you're not. And so if we're hinging our identity of who we are on things that are transient, you know, that's where you don't have inner stability is because that label can change. And so when that changes, people have a hard time making that transition and get a little lost. And that's where all this feeling of, you know, depression can set in because then you come into, you know, a, you know, a loss of, you know, who you are. And that's why the soul conscious awareness becomes more important. Um, and the last piece about the soul um, is the fact that it's this energy that is neither created nor destroyed, which I thought when I came into this knowledge that I was like, you know, I like that. I like the fact that, you know, I'm always here. And when I teach and I share this knowledge with uh, the seniors at the senior center, I think they they feel they really resonate with this and, and like this part that, you know, of course, they're facing, you know, their uh, the end. And, and so when I say that, you know, your soul is always there, this energy continues and moves forward. I think it gives people a sense of peace. It did give me a sense of peace. So a little bit more about um, the soul. So the inner energy has um, faculties within it. And one is the mind that we talked about. So this is the mind that produces those 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts um, based on um, you know, external uh, stimulus. And um, from the mind is um, the thought can uh, moves on to the intellect. And this intellect is the decision maker. And this is uh, a very much a focus. And we go into the second lesson, we talk about powers. And that's the, the most of the powers is focused on how do you strengthen the intellect? And I'll talk about that in a bit. So the intellect is a decision maker. And the last uh, piece is something called sanskaras, which is a Sanskrit word, um, which is um, talks about you know your nature, your, your personality. So this is the place where um, it registers the experience and it becomes your personality trait. 
or your habit and um, that's, uh, you know, say this person is like this, they're talking about your sanskara. And so a practical example of, of how these three work would be, you know, you get a, a thought that comes into your mind, maybe it's a new experience, you're coming to campus for the first time, never had, uh, you know, never had uh, any beer. And so you go to a party and says, you know, someone says, hey, how about a beer? And so your mind is like, um, you know, takes a thought in and then your intellect is like, you know, should you, should you not? I don't know if it's too good for you. And it kind of says, so okay, maybe first experience and then maybe you, you try it and you like, you know, that experience of having the beer and, and how you felt. So the next time around you're in that situation again, um, the mind has that desire or the feeling and it tends to bypass the intellect because it doesn't want to be questioned on what to do. And, and it's a little bit of work to uh, have a decision maker in the, in, the, in, the, in the process. And so what happens is the mind goes right to the, to the pattern. And that's where we, most of us operate is, you know, thoughts that come up and then we go to our default nature of how we react and respond to that particular uh, feeling. And so when this is asleep, that's where it becomes hard to make any changes in our life because the intellect is not strong enough to engage itself in that process to cause a change in behavior patterns. And that's where meditation becomes a huge asset in really um, strengthening this um, power of the intellect and having it intercede in, in the whole process. So I'll pause and uh, Lydia, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions or if it just uh, go forward, I will go forward. Um, I'm not seeing any questions just yet, so I think you can continue. All right, everyone's taking it all in, I'll assume. So um, just to uh, you know, summarize that piece, the mind is a piece, uh, one that experiences, the intellect is the decision maker, and the sanskars are the, um, it's the, the one that registers and creates the, the patterns of personality that we are, that we become. So I'll take a pause and we'll do a little experiment. So I know I said Raj Yoga is done with your eyes open, but in this particular experiment, I'm gonna have you close your eyes and I'll assume that you're gonna close your, you're closing your eyes and I'll um, walk through a scenario where we can experience all three of these faculties of the soul. So close your eyes and I'm assuming that you're all sitting. I'll assume that you're seated and I'll have you get up in your mind and walk over to the refrigerator. And being in quarantine, I think we're all very, very familiar with that path to the refrigerator. So go over and see yourself opening up the refrigerator. And in the fridge, assuming you have choice of two things to drink, one sweet, one not so sweet, maybe orange juice or something that I'll pick from my fridge. So take it out and pour it into a glass. And take a sip. And take another sip. Okay, put the glass down. And come back to your chair. So that is a uh, visualization and most people are able to do that. So I'm sure you're able to visualize yourself going up and that is, you know, the, the thought of getting up and going to the fridge, the intellect then discerning what it should do once you open the fridge and picking a particular, um, you know, drink. And then the second is, you know, sometimes and for me, it happens all the time is if I pick that oranges, I can see myself, you know, wanting to swallow, just getting the tang taste of the, Thing. So it's the um, uh, uh, previous experience that's recorded in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the subconscious, in the sanskara. And so those three faculties are always working and we need to be able to strengthen that. And that becomes very, very important uh, with this practice is to be able to visualize because meditation is exactly that. You know, it's this little equation here of visualization of being able to see inside and then affirmation, which we'll talk about, which is in the uh, later part of the presentation. So those two together uh, form your meditation experience. 
All right, so as I said, this is um, the first session on soul consciousness. So we've talked a lot about the soul being the one that produces those those thoughts and the mind, um, intellect, and sanskaras. So now we'll um, go into a little bit of the consciousness. So what is consciousness? So it's 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 what that what I feel that I am. So there's two different identities when it comes to consciousness. One is in a body consciousness, so based on the body, so and based on the role. You know, if someone, you know, I'm a engineer, I'm a mother, um, I'm a, um, a spiritual um, student, you know, all of those are the roles that I play in life. And the story, you know, where, where each one of us and our own stories that we, that we carry with us. So all of that is based on your body and your experience with the body. The second um, identity is soul consciousness, where these are your innate qualities of who you are. And the affirmation piece in the meditation is about really affirming, you know, your inner uh, innate qualities that go with you through your whole journey in life, which is something that we um, don't focus as much on, that we should. So the reason that, you know, we tend not to feel happy and peaceful is uh, Raj Yoga um, knowledge shares that it's because of something called body conscious vices. So something that comes from the outside. And so when we're dependent on things from, from the outside, then they'll end up being very transient and very um, um, not uh, permanent. And so as a result, we go through ups and downs when we operate from a body conscious perspective. So one of the things that we're all familiar with is this anger, the feeling of you know either the explosion of anger um, or being irritated, moody, all that comes under the umbrella of anger. So anger is considered um, you know something as a, as a vice, and we we feel it, we know it, we know it's not good for us. We you know our heart rate increases, we get flushed, you know, our body's reacting uh, not in a positive way when we're angry. So it's not something that. Um, a natural part of who we are, you know, anger is something that we have picked up as a, 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 a trait, you know, just based on our environment, our um, society, and we've come to see as anger as being, oh, it's okay to be angry. So the price of Raj Yoga says, no, that's not who we are. And uh, that's why it comes under the umbrella of a vice. The second thing is lust, the ability, the desire to want to possess things or possess people. I think we're all familiar with that feeling. The next is greed, you know, the endless um, um, feeling to have more and more. And sometimes the unending, uh, you know, bottom of the well that can never be satisfied. So you can never have contentment in life because of greed. The next uh, vice uh, that um, we share is something called attachment. Now, attachment, people can say, oh, I'm attached to a person and it's seen as caring, you know. But in this practice of Raj Yoga, it's saying, no, when you're attached to someone, you, you're either controlled by them or you, are, um, uh, you have control over them. And by that, I mean, you know, if you have someone who's close to you, you know, and they're going through a situation, they're feeling sad, and you in turn take on that emotion of sadness, so there's no stability in your life as a result of this attachment. And so this whole practice is learning how to be stable and calm no matter what the situation is. So if you're attached to people or to things, that's where it causes fluctuation in your life. And the last one, so it, all, it spells algae. So the last one is ego. So the ego, we're all familiar with that. You know, I'm right, my way or the highway. That's the feeling of superiority. Or the flip side of it is also ego, a feeling of inferiority complex. That also is a kind of ego. So these are the vices that are um, shared in this practice of Raj Yoga as ones that we need to be able to um, shift away from because these are the things that contribute to that big bucket of waste thoughts and negative thoughts. And so uh, being able to recognize that these are things that are undesirable in our life, just like the algae, all the very mucky and down below. And um, being able to see, you know, the people who are identify with some and maybe not others, people who see themselves as more, um, you know, ego as being their biggest um, issue. But in one way, one flavor or another, all of these vices uh, are in all of us. So something that we need to be um, aware of and uh, learn to say that, okay, this is something that I need to 
potentially work on if I want to have a different life experience. And so the flip side of it is the soul conscious um, being obviously is going to be all glory. Um, it's about the fact that we all have a soul within us, even though we feel like some people don't have a soul, we all do. We all have souls and the properties or innate qualities of the soul are all things beautiful, love, peace, happiness, power, purity, bliss, wisdom, and knowledge. And, you know, these are the innate qualities of the soul because this is what we all strive for in life. No one, you know, has an aim to be unhappy in life or to be miserable or to have no love. No, we strive for all of these things. And so why do we strive for them? We strive for them because that's who we are and that's our natural nature. It's, it's you know, like when you're thirsty, you know, what do you need? You need water because your body's made up of that, you know, element of water. So it's the same way the soul is um, craving for this because that is our innate nature of who we are. And this contributes to our positive thoughts. And so as we talk about, you know, this whole practice of shifting away and experiencing the inner peace and tranquility, you know, this is what we want to experience on a daily basis to have, um, you know, uh, to have that inner peace. So that's the difference between um, body conscious and, and soul conscious qualities. So to see this, um, uh, just to be able to uh, live in a, in a soul conscious way and experience all of that inner beauty, you know, we use meditation as a tool to be able to detach, you know, detach from, you know, what we're taking in from the outside, you know, our relationships. We get so wrapped up in these roles. And I remember me when I had, um, you know, the kids, anyone used to say anything about them, just it felt like an attack on me as a parent. So that attachment to that role as a mother, oh my God, it's so, it's so hard to detach from that. It's still, it's still, I'm still a work in progress for sure. But just being aware that, you know, uh, it's something that, that causes that instability in my mind when I'm so attached to a role that I play. And on that story, you know, where we came from, all the events of the past, you know, or if we were felt like you were a victim, you know, you take that, carry that along with you. So the next session we have about powers talks about how to really use your power to detach from your story in particular, because I think sometimes we we bring that story forward into our daily life. And uh, if it's not such a good experience, you know, we line up ruining our present. So being able to detach even from our story is, um, you know, a great uh, um uh, great solution with this practice of meditation and really come back to you know you know who we really are which i think has been lost in if, um, the world that we live in live in with the busyness that we have so i'll give you a practical example of how <clears throat> you know a scenario that i'm going to play out where uh, with consciousness so we've talked about the soul now with consciousness and so with state of consciousness is you know i am and then you know, how's your state of being you think and you feel and that's what creates your emotional state. <clears throat> and you have an attitude that comes um, because of that um, position. And then uh, from there, it's your vision that you create. Um, as that's how I see it. And then you take an action. And then from there, it's, you know, you create this world that you live in. So this is um, how consciousness works. I know I am, I think and I feel. So we'll go through this <clears throat> with a, an example of of someone who is body conscious. Excuse me, I was going to get a sip of water. So we'll <clears throat> go through that with a situation where you have um, a dad and he's got uh, a son who is disobedient. So the consciousness from a body conscious perspective means I'm a father, I have this son who's a rebel. And then he's, uh, the emotional state is, <clears throat> he's not very happy about it. He's got this anger um, state of mind. And the posture is, you know, I'm a father. So he identifies with the role that he plays. I'm a father, the expectation that comes along with that role as a father. And then he sees his child as being um, not very loyal. And then there's, you know, the threat that takes place if you don't do this, if you don't do that. And so what's a relationship, right? So the relationship becomes a little bit more complicated. So when we are attached to our role, when we are attached to our position with that comes with a role, you know, the things that we bring into it that land up being <clears throat> you know, not very pleasant. 
And so if we say take the same situation and go through it from a soul conscious perspective, then it's it's a different uh, experience. So you'll say, okay, so the father is like, okay, I'm a soul. You know, he's a soul too with these beautiful qualities within him. There's more of a feeling of, you know, compassion. You want to understand where he's coming from. And there's a learning there for, for both uh, father and son. And then, you know, conversation. And then, of course, you know, the relationship improves. So when you approach a situation with a soul conscious perspective, it's more even keel. It's more of it takes a lot of those roles out, that, that emotion out of it. And you're able to really, you know, deal with it from almost like a clear mind and really have a beautiful outcome. And it's more from the place of love and compassion, all those things that are innate within the soul. And I think, you know, if, if a lot more parents did this, you know, I guess we'd have less people in therapy. But, you know, I'm really trying to... Um, do this with, with my children, with my two boys. And I feel there's such a difference with how they are and, you know, just the two of them, like no competition between them. Whereas I suppose how I was raised, there was so much of, you know, uh, a one-upmanship. And so I think this whole soul conscious way of thinking that leads to a different experience in relationships. And there's more of this unconditional love that a lot of us, I'm sure, have, you know, might not have really experienced, but you can really, really bring it forward when you apply it and come, come through it from a soul conscious um, point of view. So I'll end with, you know, the whole shift here that we're um, making with this practice of Raj Yoga is really moving away from this algae of body conscious thinking and awareness and making that shift to our true identity of who we really are. And I like the ego. It's our national symbol of the bird and, you know, really flying up there. And I pick the ego with all these amazing qualities that we can bring forward when we see ourselves as these innate, beautiful beings of being egoless, accepting, giving, loving, equanimous. So I think that's pretty much it. I do have a guided experience that I, I want to share. How are we doing for time, Lydia? Great. Keep going. All right. So, um, so this guided uh, meditation experience. Uh, what I would like to do is, um, hopefully, I can get some music going in the background too. And uh, what it will be is kind of disengaging from the outer body and really focusing on the inner self and observing yourself, kind of like what we did with going to the refrigerator, but a little bit more um, in depth in the sense that we're emerging, you know, our um, qualities of who we really are and being able to emerge that. And because a lot of us have, I think, sometimes we move away from so many of these things that we've forgotten that it is something that's there within us and we've looked and searched for it outside. You know, we've looked for all of these things, especially love, you know, I think we should sue Disney because there is no happily ever after, I feel, with <laughs> with, with, uh, with others. I think it's it's tough to find that happily ever after. If you have found it, please let me know. But I think, uh, you know, this love is really something that is within all of us. And we have to merge it and really focus on self-love, which none of us have been taught how to do that. Uh, but I think it starts with us. Each one of us has to come to the place to be able to look within and, and love what you see. And I think a lot of us um, tend not to want to be in solitude because we have to look within and sometimes we don't like what we see, let alone love. So this whole practice is being able to ground yourself to your original qualities and be able to bring them you know, into your life and experience them in a practical way. I mean, that's the other thing that attracted me to Raj Yoga is, yeah, it all sounds good, but how do I use it? And that's what I um, resonated with is how to take this information and knowledge and use it on a daily basis. So um, I will go through and see if I can minimize my screen here and bring up my music. Can you hear the music? 
Hopefully with no ads. Yes, we can hear fine. Okay, so uh, rest your eyes. Um, I, like I said, it's hard to do this with your eyes open, but uh, if you wanna rest, you close your eyes, it's absolutely fine, or rest your eyes gently on uh, any point. And um, you know, sit and relax. Put aside all the roles you play in life. To the to-do list and turn your attention inward. See yourself for who you truly are. A soul with amazing qualities. of love, peace, and happiness. This is my true identity. This is who I am. As I go deeper into my mind, I see my thoughts as a river of thoughts. I stand on the banks of this river and I observe the flow. I don't judge, I just observe. I step into my river of thoughts. And feel the current all around me. I have the awareness that I'm the creator of these thoughts. I remind myself of who I am. A being of peace. A being of love. A being of happiness. I feel the current slowing down. Once again aware that I'm the master, the creator of these thoughts. I step back onto the banks of the river. And observe the gentle flow of my thoughts. I feel at peace. Bring that feeling of peace back with me.
into this body on this chair. Feel at peace. Om Shanti, which means I'm a being of peace. So that was an example of a guided meditation. So disengaging from the outside, going within, reconnecting with your true self. And the more you are aware of the inner being, the more you can change how you're thinking and shift away from those vices that we talked about earlier, the algae, and really emerge your inner being. And so what I do for myself is I have a daily practice of meditation. Uh, for me, it's usually early in the morning before it gets too crazy with the kids. But of course, now that they're home, I have a lot more time to, uh, to myself in the mornings, which is great. So I uh, use that time to do some meditation, ground myself in who I am. And so those positive, that affirmation that I talked about, right? Meditation being visualization plus affirmation. The affirmation piece is leveraging and emerging those true attributes of who we really are. And, you know, I do that in silence now. When I first started this practice, I had to do it with music or I had to have the guided meditation because my mind was just all over the place. So it took a long time. And people say, how long did it take you? I think it took me a lot longer because I was just busy with my career and the kids when I started this. So I didn't have as, as much time. But I think if you do have time, then you can definitely uh, have a better meditation experience sooner. So I've included a link um, uh, B.B. Butler Meditations. She's got great um, guided meditations. So definitely look uh, her up. She's got a, uh, at least 75 of this link right here. So you can find one that works for you. And, you know, if you're starting to practice, um, start off, you know, with just a minute or two and see how it goes. And then if you can work yourself up to five minutes, that'd be great. By next week, when we come back again, uh, it'd be great to hear if, if uh, most of you can come up to the five minute mark when it comes to sitting in and doing this meditation practice. So that's all I have, just reminding you about, um, oh, so one quick thing, uh, when I do this practice, I, um, you know, uh, make sure that I create, do it in the same space. So I said, you know, like dedicate a space to yourself. So that's very important because what happens is as you create that habit, as soon as you enter that space, your mind starts to kind of help you and quieten down before you even have to get going with your practice. So very important to find uh, a space within your house where you can do this. So it's the last slide, just um, talking about the next session that we have. That's the soul powers, what we have within the, the soul that we can leverage to make this more of an easy practice uh, for us on a daily basis to stop all that negative and wasteful thinking and uh, emerge more of the positive thoughts. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Sony. And we hope to see everyone back here at one o'clock next Friday for the next session. Thank you so much. To end this, you may you simply need to close your your um, webinar window. Thank you.